records, uh, remembers there was a man in India, he saw he was begging the doctor, can you give me at least two years so I can accomplish my plans? So what? Even you would have two years to accomplish your plans, you die anyway. So this uh, illusion, this is what powering the condition. So, so the position, Chitrakeru was well aware of what she was position. And he was simply amazed, whereby it is actually stated here that in a human culture, even husband-wife dealings, which are of an intimate nature, is the reason one gets married. So one can intimately associate with a woman. Even devotees sometimes don't really know that. They get married to not associate with each other. They get married to exhibit to each other a high grade of renunciation. You know, yeah. Renunciation means to get married. That's a renunciation. It is. Any aging we have that can confirm. It's a great renunciation. Both sides. Because you have to adjust yourself by intimate association. You will be also exposed. You will be exposed how far your sentiments go. You will be exposed how far your sensuality goes. And this is all okay. This is regulated with the wife. In a solitary place is with me. That's the reason why the Astros deserved, not only deserve, but they must have some privacy. You know, because uh, for various reasons. Because the Astros Ashrama is full of dualities, love and hate comes. That's one package. So for both uh, periods, privacy is needed. It's like, you know, Nobody has to actually be part of that. So it's, it's a very intimate affair, you know. So it is very abusive when, like example, in the name of living together, you know, yeah, uh, you would just become abusive to each other and don't respect the privacy. When the grass there comes privacy. Brahmacharya means no privacy, no need. His sensuality and his sentimentality is dealt with publicly. It should be minimal. And to the level we have something to enjoy, even it's of a mental kind, uh, but uh, something to possess, something to cherish. I was just residing one week, you know, in a house, house of Grihastas, actually, nowadays. Not only me, but actually all the preaching the word is they basically don't want to live in a temple, they reside in a congregation, you know, Grihasta houses. And that house was, I mean, any German would faint with ecstasy. It was managed to the last towel, to the last handkerchief, to the last speck of dust. Even the flowers were standing straight in the vases, you know, yeah. They were new, fresh, and they perfectly blend with the color of the curtains. Yeah. There was the stones outside which were also just accounted for. You know, everything was to the last detail. The only abstract thing was a cat which was running around the house. And she was also permitted to enter the entrance hall, eat her food and get lost again. Everything was first last. First class doors, first class uh, frames of the windows was managed by one single multitude. Big house. A good aircraft allowed this size. A little bit bigger. And you know, even the frames of the windows were not satisfactory in their original shape when they were new. They were slipped down and painted and tuned into the tone of the you know she wanted to have. The machines, dishwashing machine, laundry machine, everything top standard, just clicking, blinking. Even the digital display on the washing machine was polished and clean. The kitchen was like somebody just bought it. Even it was cooked 10 minutes ago. <laughs> it was in the shape of this thing all. Oh, they bought themselves just new kitchen, they brought it in yesterday. No, no, it was, it was standing there for the last 10 years. And it was the cooking just stopped. Now you can say this is a little bit overdone. No, you know, it's pleasant to be in a place like this, where you don't have to slight and glide on the filth and dirt of others, certainly. But uh, in itself, 
it's just the maintenance of something. It's interesting. The husband was looked quite exhausted, you know, and he was in quite exhausted mood, you know. And so he said, isn't it one day I just walked out of here and it was like a dream, you know, just poof. I said, yeah, welcome to the club. I had two houses like this. <laughs> one day you walk out, Brahmacharya sometimes they get romantic and they dream about some privacy and some house and some assets and yeah, so nice. It would be just, it would be nice, isn't it, to have my little place under control and then nobody comes in and I can control even the birds on the roof. No, you cannot control the birds on the roof. They will pass too, anyway, on your windows. But, uh, I'm like, that can be quite nice, quite peaceful actually, quite peaceful. Yeah. You know, but, uh, you know, ask any older grihastha who will you answer this. You know, how much work and service you have to do to that house alone. And how much service, you are constantly in a mood of service. Which is in itself regulating. The old grihastha is to have a, even be noticed grihastha who don't have children or something like this, to quite comfortable life. You can just have lots of choices there. When you have children, there's no more choices. That Grihastha was sitting in the evening and his daughter, 11 years old, was so well versed to walk over eBay and everything and go shopping. You know, daughters go shopping midnight. Why not? It's all internet. And she came, you know, with the, with the screens and showed him Papa, Papa, I know this will be very nice there. Papa was just looking, nodding at him, okay. And Taurus and Fathers, there's always a specific relationship. I think the one father is not corrupted by his daughter. You know, so, and they know the way, you know. It's like a female coming to you, but there's not really sex life. It is sex life on a certain level, but not that kind of sex life. And they come pop, 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 and they go like this with their hand, and the mother is laughing. She got him again. Because the mothers know, they are women. Father, that poor guy, he doesn't know, he got two women. And they know each other. It's the same sect. So, you know, so when the daughter exploits the father, the mother has a good time, she's laughing, you know. Sometimes the mother even competes with the father. Yeah, with the daughter. Who is going to exploit the father more? So you get, you get actually attacked from two sides, mother and daughter, in an extreme case. But it's loving. That means it's not perceived as an attack. It's perceived as a part of daily life. I want this and I want that. And I want this and I want that. That's how people relate to each other in a material world. Everybody wants something. So, uh, you know, and that's, so when you go through that seminar, you come out quite exhausted. And you think, oh, and one day, it's like a dream. Like Shiva Prabhupada entered Vrindavan and he wrote, all these people I knew, all my family relatives, it's just this list of names. They're not here. Nobody was running towards me down. Prabhupada, what are you doing? Father, what are you doing? Husband, what you are doing? Friend, what you are doing? He was just alone. In the midst of packed India, he was a lonely man sitting there in Vrindavan. Simply depending on the mercy of Guru and Krishna. That's all. That's the end of life. Nobody will even die for you. They're dying alone. People can stand, moan, cry, but they cannot help you to die. They cannot shape the destiny and the karma you accumulated throughout this life. So, once again, Chitrakir is praising Lord Shiva. How wonderful. You are acting actually like a handbag husband almost. Krishna actually exhibited the same actions. He was getting the Parijata flower for Satyabha Maharaj. You know, he even fought to get her something. He conducted usually Krishna service in grand style. So there was a huge battle just to get one flower. You know. <laughs> and Krishna defeated everybody and gave it to his wife. Yes. You know, yeah. Like the, the you know, like the husbands today, you know, they just buy some plastic flower and give it to the wife. You know, it's a little bit polite reflection. <laughs> you know? Yes. 
<laughs> Usually wives now when they don't want flowers, they want credit cards. <laughs> Here, take my credit card. Thank you very much. <laughs> Devotees usually are very different. Devotees don't have this large assets. But come is the you can see these girls, you know, driving fancy sports cars and operating with the credit cards of their husbands. <laughs> they are such ones in the cities you find. Them. <laughs> and they say, it's so nice, I got it all under control. No, 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 no. They are going to grow old. So solitary place is necessary for exhibition or regulation of one's material desires. So uh, I would actually, in connection with pure devotee, because Lord Shiva is not only a pure devotee, he has his own tattva, Shiva tattva, his Vishnu tattva, Jiva tattva, and Shiva tattva. So he has his own, because Lord Shiva is actually uh, Krishna in another form. Krishna in touch with the material energy, you know, but compares it with Tamarin, with acidic touch, which turns milk into yogurt. So yogurt is milk, simultaneously it's not milk, it's a milk product. You know, yogurt is kind of milk without the water. So, <coughs> Shiva is like that, because Krishna himself doesn't touch this material environment. So when Shiva is touching it by destroying it. And he's definitely doing it in an extravagant and eccentric way. If somebody really wants to see something eccentric, Lord Shiva is a good address. Everything around him is special, including the snakes crawling around his body, which is smeared with ashes from cremation places. What an aspect. You know, must be also a special wife, you know. You know, husband, wonderful, there's this cobra sitting you know, around and he is smeared with, you know, with ashes from creation, from cremation, from burned bodies. You know, why a paraphernalia? But, you know, and then he has the gun down his head and it's a whole thing. Man. Lord Shiva is amazing. And he has this little drum, you know. And he gets angry, the whole universe gets destroyed. Actually, you know, it's just uh, so don't mess around with the husband like this. And he gets angry, the whole universe is just going up. One of the functions of the destruction of the universe is that Lord Shiva makes sure that nobody survives. Reaching up to the higher planetary systems where the demigods are fleeing in fear, being far more attached as the residents of Earth and the hellish planets. Because they are in heavenly planets, and they will be destroyed too. That's the secondary destruction, the full scale. It's a half scale destruction, full scale destruction. So, on a full scale destruction, what she was due to is to search the whole universe and each single demigod he still finds, fleeing for his life, attached to his essence, he kills him with a trident. You know, yeah. that is his function. And he is laughing, he has a good time. <laughs> What an extravaganza, you know, how eccentric. So it's described what Shiva can be easily pleased and easily ended. So don't mess around with it. You know, he can be very merciful, you know, if you know, the, the, the demons try to please Lord Shiva, they usually worship Lord Shiva for material benefits, Brahma and big time demons. You know, big time demons. So, uh, Described Ravana before his destruction here at the Veena. He was playing on the Veena of Tampura, whatever it was, and by the sound he could also call it for Lord Shiva. Lord Shiva always appeared, and Ravana called him, and he worshipped him with great pomp because Ravana was the master of a golden city. You know, so he always played, but when Lord Ramachandra arrived, and the monkeys, and they were destroying Sri Lanka one after another, piece after piece. Uh, Ravana finally reached for the Veena and called for Lord Shiva for help, but Shiva didn't come. Because Lord Shiva is also a devotee of Vishnu. He is actually Vishnu, but he is actually in a service attitude to Vishnu, because it's his service to destroy Krishna's creation. Brahma is creating, 
Lord Krishna is maintaining and finally Shiva is the cleaner. He just comes up and cleans the whole thing up. And then again after a while the whole show comes into life. And then again there's something. Creation maintains the structure that we see in the material world also. So we should not be mistaken about the external symptoms of a person. That was actually the key for all the devotees in this country to make progress, not to be mistaken about Shri Prabhupada's position. Those who got the point, they strive, and those who made this deadly mistake to interpret Shri Prabhupada in a mundane way, that actually they got themselves quite in trouble, actually very much in trouble. Prabhupada said, you can fall down to the state you came from and below. You can go even lower. So, uh, one should be very careful dealing with the pure devotee, who is not going to go around and advertise, I am a pure devotee. If somebody goes around advertising, I am a pure devotee, that's the symptom he is not. So, Paramahamsa is not the one who has a dear t-shirt on Paramahamsa bow down. So, but as the devotee grew up, the advancement of the devotees was measured uh, to the degree they actually understood Shri Prabhupada's personality. Shri Prabhupada was not so, you know, he didn't imitate Lord Shiva. Even when they offered him one of the first big Vyasasans, it all came about by, by research. Prabhupada didn't say how the Vyasasan, he just explained the principle. And then the devotees were looking in books, you know, how the big Mayavadi sits on his big verses and so they said, well, Prabhupada also has to have something, that's how you worship a guru, yeah? So they discuss the Vyasasana creation, it's like incredible. You know, you have pictures in Chitna Chaitanya, Prabhupada sitting in the Vyasasana like Bedouins, you know, like some African nomads, you know. They've got this extremely colorful roof with two sticks sticking out, you know, it's like a Arabic tent. Lots of cushions, cushions everywhere, and very colorful, you know, very colorful. I remember when Prabhupada arrived in Germany, you know, we, uh, we built a Vyasa something. I was not part of it, the devotees did that. It was so quickly because everything was last minute, Prabhupada is coming and we had the whole castle to renovate. Actually, we didn't renovate one thing, we just painted over it. You know, everything was painted, we just painted like mad for two weeks. Prabhupada is coming, and then they built Vyasasans for him, which was considerably high. And I remember there was a reeling on the Vyasasan when Prabhupada accidentally made a point and leaned on it, it was going, <laughs> <laughs> it started to fall out. It was not properly fixed, it was not even nailed. And again, cushions, cushions, cushions everywhere. It was like a bed. Vyasasans and beds were not so different in those days. And then, you know, Prabhupada accepted it gracefully. In England, they got the Victorian version. When they first offered the Vyasa to Prabhupada, it was huge, it was like an altar. And it was full of these little tiny towers, you know. In Victorian culture, it's full of towers and chimneys. So it's because every chimney had its own pipe. You know, so you had 20 chimneys in, in this big castle. There was 20 little chimneys on the roof. And all these towers, little towers. You know, we have Westminster Abbey and Sri Prabhupada said, I want all our temples to look like Westminster Abbey. <laughs> the cathedral. <laughs> towers, towers, towers. <laughs> so they built the Yasasa, and you can see some photos you find. It could, you know, it put all these little things in the back. Prabhupada came and he said, This Yasasa is not for me. This is for Lord Shiva. <laughs> I don't know what he really meant by that, but it's followed Shiva. And then they gave him a garland. There's a picture of Prabhupada sitting on the Vyasa They gave him a huge garland, and the garland kind of slide down on one shoulder. So he took it actually as a Brahmin stick. You know, it was like this is a Brahmin stick. And Prabhupada looked at the devotees and said, majestically with this garland, and he said, maybe now I'm Lord Shiva. You know, <laughs> he kind of connected this whole creation to Lord Shiva. <laughs> Something very big and very extravagant and very eccentric. <laughs> so Lord Shiva definitely is the ultimate transcendental eccentric. <laughs> There's nothing uh, standard about him. There's nothing mediocre or you know, and ordinary about him. 
So one should be careful with understanding even the nature of a pure body who may look ordinary, who may look tired, who may look in need of something. You know, he may need like. So as the Buddhists were advancing more and more, Shri Prabhupada was actually teaching them more about the nature of pure body as they were able more to accept that. In the beginning, you can't imagine how they dealt with him in that kind of family array. It was of course one shower and around 20 hippies in our apartment. And Prabhupada said, this is really amazing. The most advanced nation in the whole world and they don't have even a shower. The Buddhists used to travel on a subway to another flat to take shower because they didn't have any in these flats. Prabhupada considered a flat or a living space without every possibility to take shower. It's just not livable from very point of view. So he said, it's amazing. So Prabhupada was standing in a queue, you know, behind the he with this gumption and wait until everybody took shower. Then he cooked, then he ate, then he was eating the kirtan, and then there was a big feast. And after the feast he was cleaning up. It was very regular that Prabhupada in the first love feast and Sunday feast was the one who cooked and who served. He was walking around and serving everybody. And he was very happy about that. He just was very happy that he would stay prasada. And then because he knew that will get them, that will get them. And he introduced them, induced them to eat more, eat more, you know. And uh, they never ate anything like this. You know, hippies, even being vegetarian, you know, what did you eat? Some salad and some peanuts. But, you know, when Prabhupada came up with his pots, you know, it was just a knockout. I don't even know where he got the boga from. There must have been Indian shops then all around. Prabhupada was, Prabhupada was, I just simply walked around and researched the place. Sometimes he said, I walked around days and days simply for trying to find out where I am. This everything was strange. You know, come to New York, everything is from India, first time, everything is new. So Prabhupada is actually, uh, is one devotee who, you know, this is of course, four or five years down the line, Sutama Krishna Maharaj, Prabhupada is actually, explaining the essence of actually our spiritual success. Prabhupada writes, Krishna philosophy is understood as it is stated in the Vedas. Yasya dire parabhatiya yatha vipta guru. Tasya yate kachitahi artha prakashanti mahatmana. One who has got unflinching faith in the Supreme Lord and similar faith in his spiritual master, to him only, the impulse of that ignorance becomes real. So it's based on faith in Krishna and, of course, spiritual master. Because Krishna says, I will not accept without, uh, you know, I will accept only from the spiritual master, not from you. So a spiritual master is always liberated. In any condition of his life, he should not be mistaken as an ordinary human being. This position of the spiritual master is achieved by three processes. One is called sadhana siddha, that means one who is liberated by executing the regular principles of devotional service. Another, another is called kripa siddha, one who is liberated by the mercy of Krishna of his devotee. Actually, one doesn't exclude the other. Uh, 